I would like to introduce Dr. Catherine Appleton. She is an assistant professor uh, at the psychology department of the Bournemouth University. Her research interest is in human eating behavior with a specific focus on optimization of human health and well-being in normal population. Catherine, please, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you also for inviting me. And before I start, uh, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So I'm Catherine Appleton. I was asked to talk this afternoon about eating behavior, recent developments in the field of eating behavior, and how those developments could potentially be used to encourage healthy eating. So to start, eating behavior is essentially, the st or the study of eating behavior is essentially the study of why people eat and why people consume the foods that they do. And very little of our eating as a result of hunger or thirst. If I ask you, for example, why did you eat your lunch today? Very few people will have eaten their lunch because they were hungry or thirsty. And even if you started your lunch because you were hungry, very few of you, or hunger doesn't explain uh, why you took a dessert. Much of our eating instead is a result of these much more psychological determinants, psychological factors. Factors associated with hedonics, uh, factors associated with our emotions, factors associated down the bottom with the environment or with our society, and then factors also associated with our cognitions. And these factors typically explain everyday eating very well. The majority of everyday eating are a result of the hedonic factors at the top, um, the environmental factors uh, towards the bottom. Uh, these factors explain the majority of everyday eating. Most of us will have consumed our lunch today because uh, it was lunch time, food was available, and the food that was available looked good and we thought would be tasty. Uh, these determinants have even recently been uh, advocated or even blamed as responsible for current increases in overeating and obesity. Healthy eating, however, is often considered to be something different. Healthy eating is considered to be much more under the remit of these more cognitive determinants, uh, determinants such as awareness, knowledge, uh, attitudes, and health beliefs. And again, uh, research is available suggesting that these cognitive determinants or collections of these cognitive determinants in the form of cognitive models um, can explain healthy eating. While these studies are available, however, and these studies do demonstrate success, uh, recent meta-analyses are more suggesting that although some success is demonstrated here, these cognitive models typically explain maybe 40 to 60% of our intentions to eat healthily, but only about 20 to 40% of healthy eating behavior. Strategies to try and improve the explanatory power of these models and these studies um, is typically either relied on adding extra variables to the models, as you can see here, developing whole new models, which will, um, you would have seen in the next talk. Um, but those of us that work more in the field of eating behavior have instead been asking, why are we relying on these cognitive determinants to change healthy eating? Researchers have long known that for healthy eating to impact on health, it needs to be repeated, it needs to be sustained, it needs to become habitual, and essentially it needs to become everyday eating. So why are we not relying on the determinants of everyday eating to try and impact on healthy eating? So some of us are doing exactly that, and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk to you about um, some of the studies that are going on looking at um, potentially using hedonic determinants and potentially using the environmental determinants to impact on healthy eating. So I'm going to start with hedonics. Uh, by hedonics, we're talking about likings, preferences, um, tastiness, pleasure, and enjoyment. Plenty of research is available telling us that the more you like a food, the more of it you're likely to consume. And secondly, the majority of foods that we consume, we consume because we like them. So researchers, first of all, have been looking at the possibility of simply adding, if we add a ready-liked flavor 
to a food component, a healthy food component, can we increase consumption of that specific food component? Now, we have a series of studies looking at exactly this possibility or investigating this possibility. So in these studies, uh, these are all studies conducted in older individuals, and essentially we're looking at if we add a ready-liked food um, taste to uh, a healthy food item, can we increase consumption of that item? In all of these studies, our ready-liked taste is added to food items in the form of sauce or seasoning, and our healthy food item, a high-protein um, component of an older person's meal, um, in all of these studies, meat intake or a meat. In all of these studies, we find exactly the effect you would expect. All we've done in these studies is basically compare intake for a meal with an added food um, flavor, an added ready light flavor, compared to meals without that flavor. And you can see the results. Um, we find exactly the effects you would expect, but also, of course, exactly those we were hoping for. So increased energy intakes and increased protein intakes as a result of increased meat consumption. We find the same effects in all three studies, um, and we find uh, the same effects if we use seasoning to improve our, um, or to add our ready-like flavor um, if, as if we use sauce. If we look at mechanisms, again, we find exactly the effects you would expect. If you compare the food, the meals with the ready-liked um, flavor compared to those without, we find increases in pleasantness or perceived pleasantness and increases in flavor intensity or tastiness. So these studies then very simple but very nice demonstrations simply that the addition of a ready-like flavor, flavor that individuals have chosen to add to their meal, um, can result in increased consumption of a healthy food item. We, of course, as well, aren't the only ones um, that are doing this. You can see all the studies up there, similar examples of exactly the same effect. Uh, adding a ready-like flavor in the form of a dip can result in increased consumption of a novel food. Adding a ready-like flavor in the form of a dip, again, um, can increase vegetable preferences and vegetable intakes. And then finally, adding a ready-like taste in the form of salt can result also in increased vegetable intakes. Um, many of the studies I'm going to give you, or many of the examples I'm going to give you today, are based on vegetables. Um, a clearly a healthy food item, but also obviously a challenging taste. But just before I leave this slide as well, um, please don't think of the final study there as a recommendation. Think of it as a demonstration. It's a demonstration that a light taste can result in increased intakes. Um, and the majority of these studies are done using more like herbs and spices, um, or alternatively, protein-based uh, sources and dips, or dairy-based uh, sources and dips. All of these studies, then, demonstrate the possibility of improving healthy intake simply by adding uh, a ready-liked item. But researchers are always also looking at the possibility of changing likings over time. Uh, we know we're all born with innate preferences for sweet tastes and for high fat tastes, but the majority of our taste preferences develop over time as a result of exposure and positive experience. So researchers are also looking at the possibility of using, again, exposure or positive experience uh, to increase our likings, increase our preferences for healthy food items. So the studies up on the screen now all demonstrate effects as a result of repeated exposure. So repeated exposure can result in increased likings um, and increased intakes of vegetables, the first two studies. And then finally, uh, repeated exposure can also increase intakes of fruit. Uh, the majority of work here has been conducted in children, the top two studies um, conducted in children, and there's a lot of work going on now specifically during the weaning period. Um, periods when taste preferences develop anyway. Um, but the study that we have at the bottom there actually conducted in individuals over the age of 65. Again, we find success, so it's a strategy, strategy that can be used um, across the lifespan. To look at effects due to repeated positive experience, 
Uh, repeated positive experience in the form of energy pairing a novel flavor, in this case a spice flavor, um, with energy can result in increased likings for that flavor. Repeated positive experience gained by repeatedly pairing a vegetable taste with a sweet taste uh, can result again in increased likings of vegetables. And at the bottom, repeated positive experience as a result of again repeatedly pairing vegetables, this time with a tangible reward in the form of a sticker or a social reward in the form of praise from a parent, um, can again result in increased vegetable likings and increased intakes. Um, some studies are available in this area that don't demonstrate success. Uh, the majority of studies demonstrating success are those that focus on repeated exposure and those that focus on repeated pairing with a sweet taste or again with a ready-like taste. So again, we start seeing effects again due to a ready, the addition of a ready-like taste um, to a potentially a novel taste or potentially an unlike taste, uh, again to increase healthy uh, food item intake. So these studies all basically show a potential uh, for the use of hedonics um, to improve healthy eating. I'm going to talk now as well about uh, the use of the environment or environmental determinants, um, again in exactly the same way to try and improve healthy eating. By environmental determinants, uh, we're talking about aspects external to an individual, essentially their surroundings or their situation. Uh, these include their society, uh, but we're also talking here about an individual's perception of their society. There are many environmental determinants that impact on eating behaviour. The ones I'm going to focus on um, are those that have so far largely been used to try and impact on healthy eating, those that are mostly related to food availability and the effort involved in either gaining or consuming food. So to start with, um, in terms of portions, uh, we all know the more food you provide an individual with, the more food that individual will consume. It's the whole issue around portion sizes or the whole um, problem with the portion size debate. Secondly, though, you don't just have to provide an individual with a, a large amount of food for them to consume a large amount of food. If you provide them with a large plate at a buffet, they will self-select more food than if you provide them with a small plate. Similarly, if you provide a large spoon, individuals will self-select uh, more food at a buffet than if you provide them with a small spoon. It's an effect that's related to an individual's perception of society, what they consider to be normal within their society or what their society would expect. Um, but again, it has impacts on eating behavior. And again, we could be using it to increase healthy eating. And thirdly, on this slide, the effects of effort or potential use of effort. Uh, Again, there's plenty of research that suggests the less effort required um, for either gaining food or consuming food, uh, the more food will be consumed. Uh, there are some lovely studies here as well. Uh, studies that demonstrate essentially almost an 80% reduction in snack, in snack purchasing if individuals are required to queue up twice to buy a snack as opposed to only once, uh, so they don't buy their snack with their main meal. Studies demonstrating also reduced water consumption um, if individuals are required to walk to the end of the hall to get a water jug as opposed to have a water jug on their table. Reduced ice cream purchasing if the fridge door or the freezer door is closed as opposed to open. Reduced nut consumption if nuts are shelled as opposed to unshelled. And reduced sweet consumption if sweets are wrapped as opposed to unwrapped. Very, very small environmental differences, potentially very small environmental manipulations, um, but with significant impacts on eating behavior. So researchers have again been looking at the possibility of using these environmental uh, determinants to impact on healthy eating. Uh, many of these studies also lie within theories related or within ideas related to nudge theory, uh, choice architecture, or behavioral economics. So the idea is here, essentially, can we change the environment or can we change the architecture of the environment um, to nudge people or persuade people 
um, to be making more healthy choices, um, in this case, more healthy, uh, more, uh, healthy, more choices towards a healthy eating item um, without them potentially even being aware of it. Uh, so the studies that are on screen now, again, just examples of, of these sorts of studies. These ones on screen now focus all on food availability. So the top one there, for example, uh, providing vegetables for free in a lunch queue will increase vegetable intakes. In the same, this same study, the vegetables aren't just free, they're also the only food that children could consume at that time. Uh, they also were provided before children had the rest of their lunch. So they're obviously in a state where children were hungry and ready to be consuming. Um, but so in terms of this talk, though, just simply a very nice demonstration that a change in the environment, uh, a change in yeah, the, the situation of an individual can result in increased intakes of a healthy food item. Uh, the second study there does essentially almost the same thing. Um, if you provide a child with a vegetable starter, they will consume more vegetables uh, than if you don't. And if you provide a child with a large starter, they will consume more vegetables than if you provide them with a small starter. The second study here as well is one of a series of studies conducted within the same group. And all of the studies uh, that look at this same effect demonstrate no knock-on effects in the next course of the meal. So they demonstrate total vegetable increases, uh, total increases in total vegetable intake, uh, not just at the starter um, stage of the meal. Um, the third study there as well, provision of two vegetables uh, as opposed to only one vegetable will result in, again, increased vegetable intakes. This is a study here and affects potentially your food availability, uh, but also we start coming back here to the realm of hedonics. Uh, the provision of two vegetables will, of course, provide two tastes in a meal, uh, increased tastiness, increased variety, um, and potentially, of course, increased pleasure. So let's get the studies that have used more environmental manipulations. A nice study at the top here. Um, if you position low-fat desserts at the front of your uh, food service display, um, low-fat desserts are chosen more often than high-fat desserts that are placed at the back of your display. And the second study, if you position your salad bar in the center of a canteen, uh, individuals can't ignore it, they have to walk around it, um, there will be increased salad selection and increased salad consumption um, compared to if you're... Um, Salad bar is positioned at the side of the room. You can see as well there, um, if you provide larger bowls in which individuals serve their salad and larger spoons in which individuals serve their salad, um, again, increased salad selection and increased consumption. These are all studies then that demonstrate the potential impact of environmental determinants and again the potential use of environmental determinants for increasing healthy eating. Uh, the effects that we find in these studies are typically not very large, but on a population-wide level they could of course have significant impacts on health but also the interventions used in these studies, um, similar to those ones used in the hedonic-based studies, desperately simple and very straightforward. Taken together then, um, the, these studies demonstrate a value definitely for relying on these more, the, the determinants more of everyday eating as opposed to focusing on cognitions. But just before I finish, uh, I don't want to dis dismiss the idea of cognitions. While we are finding effects here by manipulating hedonics, uh, by manipulating the environment, uh, there's still a step to be made between what's currently a desired behavior and that desired behavior becoming a habitual behavior. There's still work to be done in that whole issue of how do we make behaviors habitual or desired behaviors habitual, and there's probably place there um, for cognitive, cognitive determinants as well as these others. And with that, that should lead us quite nicely onto the next talk, except she's not here. Uh, but with that, I shall finish. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank my um, collaborators who've been involved in the studies that I've mentioned and ask if I have any questions.